All right, let's drive on. So, I, hit, I think I hit record. <sighs> Today in lecture, we are starting fresh, and we had just finished the transition to land. So we're going to start looking at classes, um, specifically, that have made this movement to land, right? Starting just like we did in lab with the amphibians who make a really great first class, as we saw, because silence, my gracious. They really do create this sort of tinder date, right, between being aquatic and being terrestrial. So we see a little bit of a linchpin between being these two places. Right? Part of this being that the juvenile stage right, or the larva stage exclusively tend to live in water or need to be connected to water in some way or another. <clears throat> and so we see all of the things that we're used to seeing, gills and fins and all of those great aquatic features. And then they're going to undergo some great transformation where they're usually going to, right, as adults, live most of their life on land. Okay. <clears throat> now the key here we've seen with our adults is that despite the fact they're living their best life on land, we still have some kind of attachment to water. And this comes twofold, right? We're still doing respiration with water. Okay, so we need to be moist, and we'll look at that. As well as we're still doing reproduction in the water, right? Because that juvenile stage is aquatic, we never are going to be completely free. Okay, so this is sort of where that Tinder dating idea comes in. That even though we're starting to make that movement, particularly as adults, away from water, that we still have a very soulful connection, so to speak, to the aquatic portion. So this means as we look at many of their traits, right, just like we saw in land, a lab, right, that we get a little bit of both, okay, which means none of their traits are going to be huge or committed one way or the other, right? Because we got to fit in a little bit of everything. Okay, so let's take a peek at some of these main features that make amphibians amphibians. Okay, so just like before, we're going to look at this the way we've looked at this before. Okay, first things first, right? Remember, we're going to look at some of the synapomorphies. Okay, remember synapomorphies are shared characteristics. These are things that start with our amphibians. Okay, but then will be shared or trickle down to all of the classes that we'll see after this. Okay, in this case, all of the rest of our land-bearing organisms. Okay. Then we'll look at some unique characteristics, what set amphibians apart, what make them a special class of their own, okay? Some of which, as we'll see, really is this reproduction piece. So I've like pulled that apart, right? Because their reproduction in particular is a bit weird, partly because they have so much variety in the way they do it, and partly because they have this special, I have to go to water to do the breeding bit. Okay. Then we'll end by pumping out these three orders, right, subclasses, underneath class amphibia, right? Amphibia is the big broad umbrella here. And then we have a neura, our frogs and toads, right? Quadrata, the salamanders, and then the gymnophiona, right? Those nightmare, legless, snake-looking like salamanders. So we'll take a quick peek at each of those to see, well, what makes each of those their own order, very lightly. 
So let's start by looking at synapomorphies. Okay. So we're going to add in a boosted cardiovascular system. So before this, okay, all of our fishes had two chambered hearts. Okay, that single circuit system. This is something we looked at in our transition to land. So we're going to increase its efficiency, right? Certainly by adding the dual circuit system. Okay, and we're going to add a third chamber. And we're going to continuously make these hearts bigger and better as we go. So remember one of the big keys here is we add chambers, right, and increase that dual circuit, right, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. All right, so step one, go get oxygen from the lungs. Then step two, actively deliver it to parts of the body, okay? This is how we're fighting gravity, making our heart pathways more efficient and better at delivering oxygen as we fight against Right, the pull of gravity on our blood and making it pool. Right. The other thing we're going to see, and we got to see a little bit already, right, in lab is an expansion of that urinary system. And we'll continue to see this in lab this week as well as we look at our reptiles. Right. So we saw our very first bladder last week. Right. Small though it may have been, so we talked about the key behind being able to hold our pee. Okay, if your pee is not going to dilute. Okay, it also smells. It's a trail that leads right to you. Right, we don't want to pee on our beds and our offspring and all of those important things. So it's a benefit to be able to hold that. Okay, we also are going to see increasingly better kidneys. I know that our salamanders didn't look terribly. Uh, particularly great last week, but still better. We noticed the kidneys, right, last week, which is certainly largely more than we could say for about most of our fishes. And this will continue to be a trend, right? Remember, as we get freedom from water, any freedom from water, we have to worry about being thirsty, right? Worry about that water and salt retention because we're not immersed in it at all anymore. And this means that kidneys and bladders and all of these things are going to play a really big role for us. <clears throat> all right, so here we see a big step in water conservation. Okay, now we talked a little bit about sensation or sensory, okay, generally in transition to land. Okay, now overall we talked about how, well, we know that most of the sense organs we talked about underwater were going to be problematic, right? Because sense organs don't work as well through water as they do through air. So we were going to need to make some general adjustments. Okay, so for example, when we talked about the ear, we said, well, we already know that we're going to have to shift how we do hearing. Remember when we were underwater, we used things like otoliths and lateral lines, right? Things that depend on literal fluid movement, okay? None of which we have as we stand here in the air. So we switched over to things that, for example, in our ear, right, depend on the vibration of air. So we talked about things like the tympanic membrane, your eardrum, okay, that do really well. It's like an actual membrane, right, pulled tight, and as air hits it, right, it stretches and jiggles and vibrates, okay. So we have that here in our frogs and other amphibians. We also do have some of those ear bones, and we don't have all three yet. Won't be till mammals that we end up with the incus, the malus, and the stapes. Okay, but we have some of them. Okay, and we'll see as we go forward, we're going to slowly improve and increase, just like we did with the fishes. All right, and we had those semicircular canals. We started with 
two, then we added a third, then we added a, we're going to go through the same process here. We know the more we have, the better it's going to be. So as we start with amphibians, right, we're just going to have a few. Okay, and then as we go forward, we'll get to birds and we'll get to mammals, right? We'll slowly add more and more. Okay, same thing as we get to eyes. Okay, the first thing we're going to add on is eyelids. It seems silly. We haven't really thought about this before. But fishes, right, bull sharks and osteaxes don't have eyelids. Right, they haven't needed them. Right, remember your eyelids. Now that we're all overthinking, blinking. Okay, help keep your eyes moist. Okay, which is absolutely pointless if your eyes are submerged underwater the entire time. Okay, so as we come up above water, advents like eyelids, right, which help refresh the fluid over your eyes. And they're all thinking very highly about how much you blink. <clears throat> become really important, okay, both for protection and refreshment from desiccation. And in addition, remember that eyes don't do a great job above water with the system that we had before. Okay, so we talked about things like the lens versus the cornea, so how do we focus light? Okay, but we also have more light, right? It's just plain brighter up here than it was underwater. So we need a series of neurons that allow us to deal with actual seeing of light above water. Okay, so that's what we see here. We have the addition of rods, which improve black and white shapes. Right, so I have much better shape recognition and pattern recognition than I did as a fish. And I switched to binocular uh, positioning. Okay, so the eyes are in the front of my face. And this allows me to have depth perception, right? Because remember with my fishes, generally speaking, I have one eye on either side. Okay, which gives me really good panoramic positioning. I can see what's all around me, but very little good spacing for what's right in front of me, right? I can't get a good idea of exact spacing right in front of me. Okay, but this changes now that I have binocular vision, which is what we have. Okay. So all of this stuff, right, remember we'll continue to add and improve on these, right, we have Lots of rods are in the example in the back of our own eyes, and we'll add to that. We can see color, for example. We also have cones. But these are some basics that we want to add to napomorphies that we will see in our amphibians. Right? And everybody after this will have these or improved versions of these. Right, so any questions? Good gracious. About our amphibian, excuse me, I'm probably away from the mic. About our amphibian synapomorphies. Okay, so a lot of these, right, are very similar to what we saw in our transition to land. They're just the very minimalist version. And that makes sense for us since amphibians are minimally committed to land. Okay, so let's take a quick peek then at what are some of the things that make amphibians separate or unique from everybody, right? So these are things that only amphibians have. All right, so remember, The first thing that really makes amphibians set out is their respiratory systems. Okay. 
So in particular, that they're using buccal pumping, which we also called positive pressure. Okay, so even though that we will see right, they have lungs, that's not necessarily unique. And they, excuse me, gracious. They are also using their lungs among several of the ways that they're respiring. They're not using those lungs the same way that most of us are, right? So they're using that store in the buccal pharyngeal pouch, right? That's that chubby pouch in their throat, right? Buccal means mouth. Pharyngeal refers to throat, right? We want to think pharyngeal arches. This is mouth throat pouch. So we're going to store that air in the mouth throat pouch, right? And then positive pressure breathing says, right, when we're ready for it, we're going to actively or forcefully swallow that air. Right? And that's unique to them. And that's the main way or one of the primary ways that they're getting oxygen. And now we're supplementing that, that being not efficient as heck, right? We all saw their lungs, teeny weeny teeny weeny lungs. So we're supplementing that with cutaneous. Right? Remember, cutaneous means through the skin. All right, so diffusion, right, which we also know can't be a primary way to respire because diffusion is not super efficient as a method to do, well, quite frankly, anything once we're bigger than the size of a cell. Okay. So remember the key here as we think about our amphibians is the fact that they're doing many of these things that makes it work out, not that they have any one thing going for them respiration wise. Okay, now metabolically, Remember, our amphibians are ectotherms. That in of itself is not necessarily unique, right? Fishes were ectotherms. We'll see our reptiles are also ectotherms. Woo. Okay. Now, what does make it a little unique? Um, as, as ectotherms, okay, they have very slow metabolisms. And so what will be beneficial for them is their metabolic rates overall are very low. And this is one of the benefits of being ectothermic overall. Okay, so because their bodies are not powering their body heat, right? They don't have to use their food to power up, keeping themselves warm. Okay. They're not using energy for that. Okay. All of their energy is largely going towards being fat and making babies. Okay. So for the most part, assuming they're in a fairly good environment, okay, their food needs are fairly low. Right. They're small, little teeny organisms. Some exclusions do apply, right? But frogs and salamanders and all these things, pretty teeny. So it doesn't take a lot of food, except in prime breeding season, right, to keep them going. And we'll see this again with reptiles as well, right? Most of the time, if they feed well, they only need to feed like once a week. Maybe once every two weeks. If it's not breeding season, right? Remember, breeding season is very active, so they need a little more juice to keep them going. Okay, this is not something that you and I can pull off, right? <laughs> if I skip breakfast, I am cranky by lunch. I'm certainly not going to go a week. Okay, now let's talk about what we know is very special about our amphibians, right? The integument. In other words, skin. Okay, now we know by looking at it and by handling them that the integumentary system, 
Whew, that's hard to say. Of our amphibians is one of the biggest things that sets them apart from all of the other classes that have come before them and will come after. Okay, so one of the big keys here is that amphibian skin has pretty much no keratin in it. Okay, so remember keratin is that compound that your fingernails are made out of. And this is one of the things that even in our skin, right, gives it its thickness and density. Okay, so our skin isn't even what I would call terribly thick or dense, right? We have diffusion pass through our skin, right? We let gases pass through. Okay, but we still have quite a bit of keratin in our skin. That's what makes it thick and kind of dry. Okay, frogs, toads, salamanders, and the whole king the boodle pretty much have none. This is partly why it's so thin and what allows that cutaneous respiration to occur. Okay, now for diffusion to be really, really effective, remember we said that they need to be wet. Now in addition to being very close to water for most species a frequent amount of the time so they can literally hop in and hop out, right, take little water baths, that happens, but we know that that's largely very unrealistic, right? I like a good bath too, but I'm not going to get in it every two hours, okay? So the other thing we see and we'll take a peek at is they have what are called mucus glands, okay? Just sort of like we have little hairs all along our skin or little sweat glands all along our skin. They have little pockets of mucus glands, right, which make them slimy. Very thin slime compared to the hagfish and stuff we've been handling. But this slime, this mucus, keeps them wet. Okay, now, they have to commit fluid from their bodies to make the mucus. Okay, but this helps with the water conservation. Right? This slime coating, one, keeps any water that they have put into their skin from evaporating and two, allows for this diffusion to occur, right? So these mucus glands uh, allow for the cutaneous respiration. Now, we also know that some, particularly some frogs and a handful of toads, and we'll look at them here in a hot second, um, as well as a few salamanders have poison glands intermixed um, in their integument as well, which is pretty unique too. Right? Nobody's going to pet me and die of being poisoned. Okay? Serve them right. Okay, but these are separate, and the poison glands are not helping with diffusion at all. Right? These are completely independent features. All right, so let's take a peek. Stop, stop. At the different types of glands that we find inside our integumentary system, right? Inside the skin. So remember that not all amphibians have poison glands. Okay, but when we do have them, there's basically two kinds that you can have. Okay, so the first kind, which is the more common of the two, are called parotid glands. Okay, so <clears throat> these are the ones we tend to find in our more common species. For example, the ones that we might find around here, like the red eastern newt. Okay, we don't have the cane toad around here. Um, you might find that in like Australia or something. Okay, these are pretty common animals though. Okay. These are all organisms that make their own poisons. Okay. Uh, so some kind of neurotoxin, okay, so for example, like a bufotoxin, okay. prefix bufo literally means toad or frog, so it just means like toad toxin. Yeah, but the idea here is they've created some kind of toxin, you eat them or touch them and lick your fingers or it's absorbed through 
your skin or your bird that has eaten them. Okay? And this is going to attack your nervous system. Okay? Meaning it'll stop your heart from beating, right? stop your lungs from being able um, to expand and contract. These are not exactly super fun ways to die. Okay, so these are pretty hardcore. This is part of the reason the cane toad, which is an invasive species when it took over Australia, was such a big deal. You can imagine having like a whole bunch of rather innocuous looking toads running around, pretty much destroying any animal that eats it. Birds, cats, the whole kit and caboodle, because it's horrifically poisonous. For the same reason children like to pick them up. <laughs> so the other type of poison that we see, which of the two is significantly less common, are alkaloids. Right. So these are like stolen poisons. In other words, recycled, okay, the literal you are what you eat kind of situation. So here we have amphibians that have gone through, they have found a food that is rather unsavory, okay, but they have built up resistance to whatever this food is. So they are able to eat it, recycle that type of food, right, <clears throat> and utilize that poison in themselves, right. So a really good example of this are with the poison dart frogs, right? classically famous for being some of the most poisonous animals on earth, right. Their main food source is the melriad beetle, also extremely poisonous, right. So our poison dart frogs are eating the melriad beetles, okay, taking the alkaloids from what is basically acid gas attacks, right? They're able to take that poison, right? Upcycle it. Acid gas attack poison gets upcycled, right? To those same poison glands. Okay, but they're very, very concentrated here then. Okay, giving them that the trash toxin okay, or that poison dart effect, okay? and their names, of course, come from the fact that locals will take the frogs and run arrowheads over them. So upcycle the third time, I guess. They're extremely deadly. <clears throat> okay, so this is a form of mimicry, right? So we can see they're bright, we can see they're pretty. And that's supposed to be admire me from the far um, or suffer the consequences type of situation. Unlikely. Right. So his question is, uh, would the frogs be more aggressive, basically? And so very unlikely towards prey, potentially, um, but they would not necessarily be more aggressive towards a predator. Or what they would see as a threat. So perfect tie-in about coloration. So as you might imagine, right, colors are also playing a large role here. So there's several different ways that amphibians, well, all organisms, but amphibians in particular happen to be very, very good at this. Because their skin plays such a prime role in how they go about their day-to-day -day lives. 
So there's three different types of mimicry that we tend to see, and some of this, as we see our perfect tie-in, plays a huge role in this poison system. Okay, so the first type of mimicry we see is called mullerium. Okay, in this case, both of the species we're interested in are poisonous or deadly. Okay, so this is very much a safety in numbers kind of issue. Okay, I'm poisonous and deadly, you're poisonous and deadly, so if we both look alike, then we can train predators what poisonous and deadly looks like, so then nobody's going to get eaten, because they're eventually going to learn and understand patterns. Okay, so if we look at the example I have up here, Right, both the red salamander and red eastern newt, both localish to the area, are both poisonous okay, and both sort of red and spotty. Okay, red's a pretty common warning color. And so the idea here is I'm red, spotty, and deadly. If you eat me, you're going to die. Okay. I'm red and spotty and deadly. If you eat me, you're going to die. Okay. Some birds, for example, are eventually going to make mistakes. It's going to take a while, particularly if you're new, for predators to figure this business out. But the more individuals that have a very similar pattern, right, the quicker a predator is going to learn. Right? Pattern recognition is the same across all organisms. Okay. So this is where we get that safety in numbers idea. Okay, I'm still going to kill you if you eat me. You'll be punished. But you're less likely to eat me because everyone else who looks like this is also deadly. Mwahahaha. Okay, so Mullerian mimicry. I'm named after the gentleman, of course. I discovered it. I don't understand because how, okay, so I understand why, like, they wouldn't get eaten, but I don't understand how they all start to look the same, I guess, would be. Or do they already look the same? Like, so, I like the evolution of it, like, I don't really understand how they, like, evolved to look the same. Well, so if you were to imagine, for example, like the red salamander population beforehand, right, you would have had a wide variety of colors. Right, and so you'd be more likely to live. So, say we had like red, orange, brown, and green ones, right? All of them are poisonous, right? But birds, for example, would be more likely to eat the ones that are, ones that are yes, okay. because they're associating redness with poison, okay. or more likely to associate redness with poison. Okay, now, not everybody is honest in the amphibian world or in any world, right? So the next type of mimicry that we have is called Batesian mimicry. Okay, again, Batesian just being the individual who discovered it. Okay, but Batesian mimickers are liars. Okay, and they're depending on that mode of learning that we established in Eulerian mimicry, right? So here in the previous version, we sat and taught all of the birds, hey, red salamanders are poisonous, you're going to die. Okay, so this is what we just trained everybody on. Dead. Poison. Scary. So, what I can do as an amphibian is fake being scary.
All right, so I can take on some of the features that scary, deadly amphibians have. I'm committed super hard. Okay, but I'm not actually poisonous either. Okay. So I'm scraggly and I'm red. Okay, and at a glance, right, this flash of red color would be enough to make a bird go, wait. Wait. Okay. Now, am I 100% convincing? Definitely not, right? But if you're looking for dinner and you see that flash of red and you go, hang on, hey, those couple of seconds of hesitation can be the difference between being alive and being dead, which is all you need. Run away. Free. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. So being able to escape via that trickery, right, fakery, can be very effective. Okay, so similar shapes, patterns, and colors okay, is the effective method in Batesian mimicry. Okay, I'm not poisonous or deadly. I don't stick or bite or anything. Okay, I just have a cloak of trickery on. So it's similar. So this is similar to Mullerian, except if I was Mullerian, I would actually be deadly. Right? But in Batesian, I'm actually fine. Right? So this is the big difference. If I'm a Mullerian mimicker, I will actually be poisonous. Right? Remember in Eulerian, we were both deadly, team deadly, okay? In Batesian, I'm just sneaking into the club I don't belong into. So the, the red intermediate is the uh, Eulerian or a bad Batesian? The red back salamander here is no. the Batesian. Okay. The red eastern newt is Eulerian. Okay, yeah. Right, our red eastern newt is one of our team members from last slide. The difference between Batesian and Mullerian, nice and clear. There's only one more type of mimicry, so this will be our last one then. This is significantly different, right? So we're going to completely jump off the bus of whether I'm poisonous or not. And then literally just say to heck with the whole thing. I don't want to run the gambit of <laughs> is the bird going to figure out whether I'm poisonous or not. That feels really risky. Okay. And I'm a little more shy than that. So I'm thinking no. I'm just going to hide. Okay, so my goal here under cryptic, so if I'm on something just named intuitively, right? My whole goal here is to just never let the bird see me to begin with. Okay, so there's no poison involved at all in the first place. Okay, my goal is to just hide in the shadows. Okay, I am ninja. You guys got it? I have my Socrative up.
my last two rows when you have everything all set. You are free to go. Please have a fabulous day. Everyone else, you may also go. Please have a lovely afternoon.